Hi everyone, and welcome to our third episode of Species Shorts. Um, my name is Lindsay Barone, for those of you who haven't tuned in before. Um, and today we are going to continue our exploration of the hominin fossil record by actually looking at one of what I think is one of the more interesting species ever found in the hominin fossil record. And that species is Artipithecus ramidus. So just like we did last time with the Sahelanthropus chadensis, um, I'm going to let you all take a really close look at the fossil before we talk about it in a lot of detail. So I have an Artipithecus ramidus skull here. So take a look at its face, make some observations about it. What do you notice? What maybe looks similar to our own faces? What's a little bit different? This is what the side of the head looks like. This is the underside of the head, and we've got the face over here and the back of the skull over here. Um, and this, of course, is that foramen magnum we talked about a little bit with respect to Sahelanthropus chadensis, and we'll talk about again today. And then this is what the back of the skull looks like. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, and maybe for those of you who missed the Sahelanthropus chadensis episode, um, let's hold them up side by side. So, in my left hand is Sahelanthropus chadensis. In my right hand is Artipithecus ramidus. Sahelanthropus chadensis is about 7 million years old and was found in Central Africa. So, this is from the Central African country of Chad. By contrast, Artipithecus ramidus is a little bit more recent. And by more recent, I mean it's only 4.4 million years old instead of 7 million years old. Now, Artipithecus ramidus and its, um, and its sister species, Artipithecus cadaba, are both found in Eastern Africa in the country of Ethiopia. Now, you may recognize Artipithecus ramidus in particular because roughly 10 years ago, when they, they first described this fossil find, it was a really big deal. It was everywhere in the news, even if you don't pay attention to science journalism or the academic publications, Artie was a big deal. And that's the nickname that this individual specimen has been given, Artie. Now, why was this such a big deal? Well, there are a couple of reasons why people really freaked out about it. Um, first of all, this is a species that really seems to have this weird mixture of more ancient primitive traits, more like what we'd expect to see in the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, but it also has more modern derived traits like what we'd expect to see in a modern human. So it's this interesting intermediary step between the two branches of the primate lineage. Another reason why people made such a big deal out of it is because there have been over a hundred specimens found associated with Artipithecus ramidus which is a lot for the hominin fossil record. And this individual in particular, so this is the Artie specimen, um, this was very, very complete. Um, Artie's body was about 50% complete. Having 50% of any one individual in the fossil record is extremely rare. Um, mostly what we find are bits and pieces of lots of different individuals. So having one fossil that was roughly half complete, was a really interesting glimpse into what an individual Artipithecus ramidus might have looked like. So let's talk a little bit more about Artie and what we know about this particular fossil. Well, based on the skeletal remains, based on the fossil remains, we know that Artie was female. Um, we also know that Artie was probably about three feet, 11 inches tall, um, not even four feet. So these are really, really small hominins, um, especially when you consider, you know, most people today are over the five foot mark. This guy as an adult is pretty small. Um, using different ways of reconstructing weight, we know that this individual was probably right around the 110 pound mark. So they were probably pretty muscular, pretty big, individuals. 
what else do we know about Artipithecus ramidus in general? Well, like I said before, um, there are some interesting mixtures of traits that are a little bit more ancient and a little bit more modern. And nowhere do we see that more when it comes to the anatomy that has to do with how they move around in their environment. So specifically, are they a biped? Are they a quadruped? Are they on the ground or are they up in the trees? Well, the answer is a little bit of all of those things. Um, so Artipithecus ramidus has some really unique traits. It has really high shoulders and it has really long arms. Um, these high shoulders with these long arms and it also had long, very curved fingers. Well, all of those traits are really good for climbing around in the trees. You don't tend to see those kinds of features on animals that are obligate bipeds the way that humans are. Another thing that we see is that in the foot of Artipithecus ramidus, they have what we would describe as a divergent big toe. So what does that mean? Well, basically, and you can actually look at your own hands and feet while we're talking about that, um, but if you look at your hands, so you've got your hands here, and you see how the thumb kind of comes off to the side rather than being in line with the rest of your, your fingers. The way our thumb comes off is what the toe, the big toe looks like on Artipithecus ramidus. So it's diverging from the rest of the toes. Having that divergent big toe is something that's really helpful when you're grabbing onto branches and grasping things while you're moving around. If you look down at your own feet, and unfortunately I'm not flexible enough to stand here and show you my feet at the same time, um, but if you look at your feet, you'll notice that your big toes are right in a line with the rest of your toes on your feet. That is an adaptation for bipedalism. Um, that's something that we tend to have because it helps us maintain balance. It also gives us a springing off point for every single step that we take. So that's a really important thing that makes us think that, okay, Artipithecus ramidus was probably spending some time up in the trees. Um, the fact, too, is that the environment that these fossils, when they were alive, would have been living in was sort of a, a mixture of grasslands and woodlands. So there would have been trees for them to be climbing up in and maybe even spending large portions of the day in. However, they were not only spending time up in the trees. They were also likely on the ground walking around on two legs. So remember, over the last couple of episodes, we've talked about how habitual bipedalism is one of those defining characteristics of the hominins. Um, and Artipithecus ramidus is no different. So what makes us think that this was a biped, but also climbing around in the trees? Well, just like before, one of those really diagnostic features is the positioning of that foramen magnum. Um, so just a quick review, the foramen magnum is the place in the bottom of our skulls where the neck and the spinal cord attaches with the skull. And so what you tend to see in a biped is that the foramen magnum is closer to the front of the face. So we call that an anterior foramen magnum. And that allows the skull to balance on top of the neck rather than projecting forward off of that neck. So we see that with Artipithecus ramidus. Um, another thing that we know is that the legs are starting to look a little bit more like what we'd expect to see in an obligate or even a habitual biped, um, particularly when it comes to the knees. So one of the things that's really um, unique about our legs among the primates is that we have this ability to fully extend our legs. So we can actually straighten out our leg fully. We can lock our knees, even though you're not really supposed to do that, that's bad for you. Um, but theoretically, we can fully extend that leg out and that knee out. Artipithecus ramidus has that same anatomical ability. We don't see that in other non-human primates like chimpanzees or gorillas because they're not adapted for bipedalism the way that the hominins are. 
So we're starting to see that important knee feature um, evolving with the Artipithecus genus. Um, other things that we see have to do with the shape of the hip and the pelvis. So they're a, a little bit more of a bowl shape that helps maintain our upright posture. We see that with Artipithecus ramidus as well. So these guys I would classify as habitual bipeds rather than obligate bipeds, but they definitely are starting to have more adaptations for walking around on two legs. All right, um, so one last thing I wanna go over very quickly um, is just what this looks like in relation to our own skull, because I showed you the Sahelanthropus skull next to Artipithecus ramidus, but how does this fit in with our own bodies? Well, obviously, just like with Sahelanthropus, you can see that this is an adult, and I'm an adult, and this is much smaller than I am. Um, so we're talking about a, a cranial capacity that's probably between 300 and 350 cubic centimeters. Now, ours is roughly four times that. Um, so if you look, I've got a human skull here. Um, if you look at our human, and you look at our Artipithecus, you can see you've got that much larger brain size. Um, you can see too that just like we talked about last week, we've got a little bit more of that brow ridge on Artipithecus ramidus. Um, we also have slightly larger canines. So you can, can see here that the canines are a little bit bigger and pointier than the rest of the teeth. Um, we don't see that as much in the human skeleton. You know, the, the canines are not nearly as noticeable or different compared with um, the rest of the teeth around it. So speaking of teeth, the last thing I want to point out is that something that's really unique about Artipithecus ramidus is it still has very thin molar enamel. Now, this might not sound like a big deal, but what we see is that um, the molar enamel, when it's really thin, um, that tends to indicate that the animals are eating a softer plant-based diet. So from this, we know that Artipithecus was likely um, eating fruits, grasses, leaves, maybe some ants and termites. Um, so they likely had a very similar diet um, to what we see with modern chimpanzees because they have a similar thickness to their molar enamel. All right, um, so that is all I have for you all today. Thanks for tuning in once again. If you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the comments. And otherwise, I will see you on Monday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, and we'll start talking about the Australopithecines. Have a good weekend.